my name is Corey Welch. I'm going to be our moderator for the day. And um, uh, each of these panelists are going to share a little bit of our story and our journey into science. And there'll be an opportunity for you to ask us questions. Um, and particularly the agenda we'll talk about for five, six minutes about our background a little bit. And then the discussion with you guys. So there's the microphones there and there for you to come approach. And kind of some things to think about while we're talking is some of the cultural barriers we may have uh, interacted with, being minorities in a majority population often. Um, how to apply to grad school or what grad school is like, those kinds of questions that you can ask us. Um, career advice, ask us anything, okay? So being a PhD researcher, I think this applies to all of us, is it gives us certain credibility. It gives us opportunities to talk to an audience like this fairly often. Um, it means we've worked on data collection, data analysis, critical thinking, problem solving. It also means we have experience working with lab groups and in field settings. We've taught classes, we've mentored students. It also means we've screwed up a lot of experiments. Um, we've given bad talks, hopefully not this one. Um, we've written many bad grant papers. Um, and we've handled failure, rejection, and kind of uncertainty. Um, it also means our family thinks we're kind of weirdos, but so those are all part of who we are. Um, our first speaker is me. Yay. Um, <laughs> so, um, my background is I'm from Billings, Montana. I'm a member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe. Um, I currently am the research coordinator and advisor for the Biology Scholars Program at UC Berkeley. Yeah. Behave yourselves. OK. Um, I'll be starting a new position at Iowa State in January, so it's a big transition career thing for me coming up. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that too. Um, <laughs> so um, what do I do as a research coordinator and advisor? Um, basically, students get into research, um, learn how to um, talk to faculty, how to apply to these types of programs, how to struggle through being a first-time undergraduate researcher, how to transition into grad school and onto a postdoc or faculty job. Um, my mission is basically to diversify who succeeds in biology. I have my mission aligns with Sockness beautifully, and I love that. So um, I'll see those students there. There's from my from previous summer, there's 19 students in that photo that have presented or are presenting at Sockness. So I love that. So how did I get here? Here's some of the non-human animals some humans that have helped me get along this way. Um, I worked on honeybees as an undergrad. I worked on some rodents for a master's degree, a carnivorous rodent that howls. You can see it tipping its head back there. Uh, lots of field work. Um, and I worked on some other weird mammals that live below ground. And I taught at Haskell Indian Nations University for a few years as well. A little shout out to Haskell. Um, so here's my letters. and. and where I got my degrees and things like that, and where some of the research things. I put head for you to potentially, you can harass me about I'm a rock star student. I'm a 3.0 GPA, isn't that? Um, I started a PhD and didn't finish the, init the initial. That was a conscious decision, and there was a good reasons why that. So you can harass me about those kinds of things as well. Um, so anyways, did the postdoc, did all the research, those kinds of things. Um, my roots as a biologist, family, um, my grandfather is seated on the lap of his, my great-grandmother, um, and they were, that plantation, uh, sorry, that homestead, Edison Rock's a pretty famous place in, uh, in Indian country as far as, uh, um, and I love that photo also because there's pocket gopher dirt mounds right below it, if you can see that on there. Uh, tradition of why I'm a biologist is related to a phrase we call um, basically, we learned to pay attention to nature. My grandfather liked to drive on the country roads, and you'd be in his pickup truck bouncing around and be like, what do, why are we going down this road? Let's see what we can see. And it was those hours of sometimes boredom, but oftentimes amazing experiences where I got really good biology eyes, and I still have those today, um, where I pay attention to animals and plants and looking around. Um, I'm kind of a weird family. I have nine half-brothers and sisters. Um, my parents were brought together through Indian Health Service. Uh, both of them have or retired from Indian Health Service and worked about 70 years between the two of them on the behalf of Indian Health. 
Um, I learned empathy and social justice from them, and I continue to take lessons from them to this day. I'm basically a mama's boy, though, and my mom um, would hate one of those photos, but, and it's not the one where she has a bird on top of her head. She thinks that's awesome. So, um, but yeah, I just had to throw that photo in there, and that's it, my getting my PhD. Um, I won't get into these earlier barriers. There's just some things that could all trip us up, and so we'll kind of, if you want to ask about those, each of us has these things. We're not going to have time to go into them, okay? I had research mentors along the way as an undergraduate. I didn't know what grad school was. So I had a couple of the first two guys on the left were undergraduate mentors, Dr. Tom Darrow and Dr. Mike Breed. Dr. Ray Parati introduced me to softness. I did a master's with him. I met Scott Edwards, uh, the ornithologist at softness, and he recruited me to the University of Washington. Scott's here, I think, tonight, but he's a regular. And I finished my PhD with Dr. Um, I have professional mentors to this day. Uh, Scott, again, the Sockness Leadership Institute has been a wonderful cohort of peers and the Sockness Leadership to help me professionally move on. And John Matsui, um, who's the director of the Biology Scholars Program, and he's going to be uh, given an award tomorrow night. So. Um, these people are going to be, continue to always be part of my life professionally. And lastly, when you're going to go through all this education and research, you've got to have a weird support network of friends, families, dogs, whatever it can be. So um, these are all important things that you should kind of make a special stock of assessment of yourself, because you're going to rely on these support networks as you move through each level of your education. My last general advice. I want you to view yourself as a scientist. You're not pre-med, you're not pre-health, you're not pre-math. You're a scientist right now. You're a biologist right now. You kind of, you're not very good biologist right now often. <laughs> but hey, I wasn't, and I got better every year of my education. So view that a year from now, you're going to be such a better biologist than I was when I was listening to Corey. Um, remember, getting a college degree is a revolutionary act. And look around here. A lot of your peers, a lot of my peers and friends started here. And these are network support that you should tap into. And with that, I'll conclude my comments and introduce our next speaker. Oh, thanks. It's Dr. Carletta Cheek. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be a part of a very uh, esteemed panel here. And uh, I am Bitter Water, born for Near the Water Clan. My maternal grandfather is Red, uh, Red House Clan, and my paternal grandfather is uh, Red Running Into the Water. And this is how I identify myself as a Navajo person. I'm originally from the Four Corners region of Arizona on the Navajo Nation. And I was born uh, on the Navajo Nation speaking Navajo as my first language and raised uh, without electricity or running water, but having a real strong family where we were taught cultural values and hard work ethics. And having a really close knit uh, family support as well as being really mentored by uh, my elders, including my grandmother especially. I have two sons, uh, Tachitni is three years old and Jehojo is uh, one year old. And um, my husband is Johnny Walker. Um, I was motivated to go to college because of the environmental degradation that my family and my community experienced from mining, including contamination of water, soil destruction, and air pollution. And I'm a first generation college student and I never uh, met anybody that went to college and nobody in my family had gone to college. So I relied a lot on uh, the school support system through my high school in, at Page High School particularly two uh, counselors at my school, Ms. Purdy and Ms. Clyburn, who guided me uh, to prepare myself to go to college. And the main uh, way that I was able to do so was through Upward Bound. And through Upward Bound, I was able to uh, take the 
um, SATs every summer for one week for eight hours a day. That really helped me and um, got me to, to Stanford. And there um, I got a BS in civil and environmental engineering. And I have um, a lot of credit due to my mentor, Dr. Jim Leckie, who is actually going to be the keynote speaker on Saturday. So I encourage you to attend that dinner. I also participated in the American Indian Summer Immersion Program, as well as the um, Latino and Native American um, math uh, program. Um, after I was there, I decided to do something different. And uh, when I would go back to the reservation, my people would think that I don't speak Navajo, and so I decided to run for Miss Navajo. And one of the things I did had to do was butcher a sheep and show that I could build a fire and cook fry bread. And so that was something different for an engineering student and really um, got myself out to do some public speaking. I came back to uh, do my PhD at the University of Arizona where I pursued um, hydrology. And uh, being an NSF doctoral fellow, um, I had the freedom to choose the topic. And so that required a lot of networking with faculty. And it was a very challenging time, um, especially because uh, I was required to publish three papers. But through the support of my advisor, I was able to do so. And then I went on and um, pursued a, a postdoc at Desert Research Institute because I was interested in going into academia. And now I'm back at the University of Arizona, and I decided to stay in the Southwest because I really want to stay close to the reservation and um, was very fortunate to come back. And I'm in a different department than where I was at, but um, I also have an extension responsibility. In addition to my research, I um, do work with tribes, and this is one way that I can give back. And one way um, I've been able to do so is do research related to climate change impacts to tribes, particularly how climate change is going to impact their water resources. So I participated in a um, national-wide effort to write papers and recently wrote um, two papers published in Climatic Change on that work. And so what's next for me? Uh, I want to continue to give back to my people, to Native America, um, continue support and uh, funnily Native American students from the reservation to tribal colleges to four-year institutions in the STEM field. And I believe that, you know, I want to apply my traditional belief in hojo, which is having a balanced and holistic view of your life and your research. So I do that through making sure I practice that in, in my work and um, and, and then also uh, finding ways to give back to my community that way. Thank you, and without further ado, I will introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Noe Galvin. Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, my name is Noe Galvin. I'm a principal toxicologist at Neutralide. It's a business unit of Amway. It's actually uh, Neutralize actually here in California. Amway, which is the headquarters, is in Michigan, so I'm very happy that I'm based in California. The weather can be rough out there. So I've been part of SOGNAS for over 20 years. I've been off and on as an active participant, as uh, an employee. Uh, it used to be based at UC Santa Cruz, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Let me start by sharing a little bit about my adventure <clears throat> as a scientist, where it started. I'm originally from Mexico. I was born and partially raised, I'll say, in the state of Michoacán. It's kind of the southwest of Mexico. I was originally going to put some arrows there, but you'll have to maybe go back and look and see where Michoacán is at. Uh, born there, uh, we moved to California, L.A. area, so it's great to be here. It's an honor to be able to speak today with the panelists. Uh, moved to L.A., went back to Mexico, came back to L.A., moved back to Mexico. <laughs> Eventually, I came back with my brother, but my parents stayed behind. Uh, so I have just a, a few p pictures here that I'd like to share. Uh, the first one right down the top left is uh, when it was four of us, uh, the first time we came to the U.S. The youngest was born here. Uh, and then right to the, to the next picture there on the right, uh, it was five of us. That's how many are in my family. Uh, I'm the one, the, the, the shorter one of the two boys there. Um, and then my parents, 
Family is always very, very important to me, very supportive. Uh, they would come up and visit uh, during the summers or as they had opportunities. This was during high school. Uh, so when I came and I stayed, I share this, uh, I kept my high school ID actually. Um, and this is in 88, that's when I started high school here. Um, and below, I like to share this uh, picture because the lady there was what I call my first mentor. And you'll see that mentoring and networking is really a big part of Saknas. And she was the first mentor outside of my family, is what I'll say. She helped me really navigate through how do you even apply and get to uh, school, bachelor's degree, outside of your community, and really pursue what you want. At this point, I had a lot of questions. Going back and forth to Mexico and the US, I saw a lot of differences. And a lot of it revolved around the environment and how contamination, pollution, pesticides, everything, how it impact the ecosystem as well as the individuals. And then I share a few more pictures here. On the top right uh, is when I graduated from Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, that's me in the white shirt with the blue jeans. You probably don't recognize me because I have hair there. <laughs> you can see the picture below. It's a little more current. That actually looks like me there. Um, this is about a year ago with my parents and sisters and so on. So in 1992, I went on to UC Santa Cruz uh, to pursue a bachelor's in molecular and cellular biology. And at this point is when I first became involved with SACNAS at the beginning of my undergraduate career. And I have their two universities as well there, Princeton and Wisconsin. And it was through networking and, and mentorship at SACNAS that I was able to have the opportunities to do these internships, which led to wanting to pursue toxicology. And that's what really opened my eyes to what it is that I can do in terms of a profession that would answer a lot of the questions that I had growing up on the impact on the environment, and in turn, how does it impact the human being and other biological systems. Uh, to the right, I have a couple pictures there when I graduated from Santa Cruz, my aunt and my mom. When I lived here in Los Angeles while I was going to high school, I lived with my aunt and my uncle. Uh, they're like my parents as well. So very supportive. Uh, and underneath you'll see Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, through networking, I was able to get that opportunity to work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, for one year before going out to graduate school. And in 98, I went on to the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, and pursued my PhD in molecular and environmental toxicology. Uh, I had an advisor. You know, a lot of the support uh, for you to be able to accomplish your PhD comes through mentorship and you have an advisor as well. They guide you through until you're ready to go out into the world. Uh, during the time at Wisconsin, I also got exposed to the Society of Toxicology, which is uh, right underneath. And this was more the professional part of what I was studying and what I was doing. And one key th thing that I did while I was there and part of this society is networking, which was nothing new because I had been doing it while I was at SACNAS. So take advantage of that and get to network and make some connections and talk with folks here. Then I did a two-year postdoc at Cal, at UC Berkeley, and I have uh, here, a couple pictures of my advisors there as well, Dr. Martin Smith and Dr. Lu Ping Shang. And during that time, um, I did some research in the lab. I also had the opportunity to go to China and do some field work for about a month and a half. Great opportunity, multinational team, a lot of exposure, what I could do beyond just being in, in the lab. And underneath there, I'll put another um, plug. Uh, there's gonna be a booth for the Society of Toxicology. And this is a, a group that was created in 2004 and became a special uh, interest group at the Society of Toxicology. And the name of it, you cannot see it there, it's the Hispanic Organization of Toxicology. And I really like that name. I, I don't know how much thought they put into it, but it's really nice because when you take the acronym and you say Hispanic, H, Organization, O, of Toxicology, take out one O, put a T, it's hot, right? <laughs> what else can we have for toxicologists that come from Latin America and uh, you know, <laughs> we're helping out the environment? <laughs> So please look for us out there, and you're welcome to come. And if you have questions about toxicology, come on down. So when I came back from uh, China, I was uh, fortunate to get a call from the Clorox company. And I was really surprised, but then realized that that call came because of previous connections and networking that I had done within toxicology and within SACNAS as well. And sure enough, uh, in 2006, I started... Uh, I'm sorry, 2000, yeah, 2006, I started working at Clorox. Uh, again, the gentleman you see below there is Dr. Reddy. He was my mentor during that time as well. I was at the company for five years. Um, had a great time there, a lot of learning. And just recently, well, three years ago, 
I went on and I had this great opportunity at Neutralite, uh, which is a nutrition company, and I went from doing toxicology and evaluating the safety of consumer products, cleaning products, antimicrobial products, to having the opportunity now to look at dietary supplements. How do you do nutrition toxicology? So I've been doing that now for three years, uh, based here out of uh, Buena Park. Uh, there's a lot to come, there's so much growth going on within the company, and I view that as the opportunity for me to continue to grow as a scientist as well within industry, but at the same time share those learnings and keep coming back to meetings like SACNAS and other organizations like uh, HOT and the Society of Toxicology. So without further ado, I'll stop there and I'll introduce Dr. Teresa Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galvan. Good afternoon. It's such an honor to be here today because I was in one of those seats not long ago. So my name is Teresa Ramirez. I'm a Brown University alum, and I'm currently an NIH postdoc research fellow. I was born in Torrance, California, and I grew up in the city of Compton, California, where I attended um, Compton Public Schools. I'm also first generation Mexican American and the first in my family to have graduated from college and to have pursue a PhD, which means a lot to me because my parents are my role models and this is for them too. And here's just some images when I was a kid growing up. I look the same, right? <laughs> and then there's an um, older picture where I have uh, my I Love Compton. This is my family. I come from hardworking parents who migrated to the States from Zacatecas, Mexico in the 1970s. And today, it's such an honor because my parents are here for the first time at a SACNAS conference, Juan and Selena Ramirez. And also, and also my friend, Bertha Viña, my friend Bertha Viña, who's my best friend from elementary school. So they get to see what I'm part of. Um, as a kid, I was always very curious about how things worked. And in the sixth grade, I had the first time opportunity to participate in, my, in a science fair in which I had a question, do seeds contain oil? And because of this question, um, I was in Benjamin O. Davis Middle School, I won third place. So I was really excited about this. Once, um, there's another picture there when I was in high school, I graduated with honors from Compton Senior High School and I was a salutatorian, class of 1998. I graduated from California State University, Dominguez Hills, <laughs> with a bachelor's in science in general biology in 2004. I then wasn't sure what I was going to do, so then I pursued for a post -back program at the National Cancer Institute, and guess what? That information was obtained from a SACNAS conference, and that was in Frederick, Maryland from 2004 to 2006. Then after that, I decided that I wanted to go and pursue a PhD, same thing, got the information from, from here, from SACNAS, doing summer internships, and I went to Brown University where I obtained a PhD in molecular pharmacology and physiology. Just recently, I was able to obtain my PhD. Thank you. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you. I'm currently a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health in the National Institutes on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in Rockville, Maryland. And, it's, and it gives me great pleasure because it's because of my mentors and role models who gave me that support and that push that I needed, and that's what helped me to be where I am today. And especially, I give thanks to my parents because of their hard work, I am who I am, and also all my mentors. I have many, there's only some there. But in particular, I wanna give thanks to one of my mentors, Dr. Laura Robles, who was my undergraduate research mentor, who introduced me to SACNAS 14 years ago and she paid my life membership. And there's also um, Ms. Janice Brown, who recruited me when I was in high school to go to Cal State Dominguez Hills, and many others, and also my SACNAS familia. These are just images of my graduation with my PhD, which was one of the most happiest days of my life. You could see it by my smile and jumping. Um, it was an amazing day, and you guys could do that too. And these are just images of me working on the bench, the Mexican-American scientist, and also wherever you go, be proud of your culture, take it with you, don't let it go, and don't be embarrassed of who you are and where you come from. And these are just images here. I was part of the Brown Mariachi group. You could see my traje. I'm working in the lab, so yeah, a scientist. 
And I published my first author publication as a graduate student um, in 2012. And there you see a picture with my research advisor, graduate research advisor, Dr. Suzanne De La Monte. I learned a lot. And one thing that I would like to, to leave with you is these few quotes from um, the book, uh, All the Places You Go from Dr. Seuss. is one of my favorite books. It says, congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Y si se puede. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a question of the panel to get us started. But while that's happening, there's a microphone to your right. There's a microphone to your left. We're going to keep you in here for an hour. So you better make this worth our time, or your time, actually. Um, but there's a great opportunity to ask us any question about some of the things we've experienced, challenges we've faced, et cetera, OK? So I'd like to ask any of you guys, you can dive in at any point, which would be, what was kind of one of the crucial moments where a mentor kind of helped you? Like in hindsight, you almost got tripped up and lost your way towards the scientific career that you're at now. Well, I have an experience where it wasn't really a mentor, but it was a professor in college um, where, you know, when you have to ask for letters of recommendation, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that you ask the person if they could write a good letter and somebody who knows you because I made the mistake of thinking that the professor I was asking was going to be honest and genuine on his letter. And he gave me a really bad letter, which actually was unfortunate because I thought in my eyes, oh, he's such a great person. You know, he's helping me out. I'm applying for a scholarship. Um, he's going to be a great person to write this letter. It was not the case. Um, he wrote the worst letter. I didn't get the scholarship. But you know what? Things happen for a reason because I learned from that lesson. And every time I would see this person, he would actually avoid me. But he never knew that I knew about this. But I always greeted him with a smile. And I said, you know, he's not going to stop me. So that was something that I was, over, uh, was able to overcome. So now that's one thing you, when you're applying for graduate school, summer programs, make sure you ask for a strong and good letter. Anybody else have anything else you want to add on that? Yeah. Sure, I'll jump in real quick. I, I think uh, the fork in the road happened for me when I went on to UC Santa Cruz and I thought it would be easy to pursue a degree in Spanish. Um, I said, I'm already fluent. This is going to be an easy hurdle. I'm going to do it. But then I realized that I was not pursuing what I had the passion for, which was getting answered to a lot of the questions that I had while growing up. And Spanish was not doing it. Then I got to phonetics and it was not Spanish anymore. So I had to say, OK, it's going to be science. Um, and I think that's really what did it. And it was through mentorship that occurred at SOCNAS. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, my first internship was what really opened up that vision for me and mentoring that I got while I had Santa Cruz from my uh, professors there as well. So that's kind of what did it for me. Okay. All right, I see that there are a ghost here and a ghost there ready to ask questions. I will call out on people. I know about 25 of you personally, I will call you out. So please, come forward to ask questions. Um, on a related note, um, where do you see yourself in the next five years? <laughs> oh, I threw that one. That's a Sockness Leadership That's... Institute question that they throw at you guys a lot. Um, I'll answer first, and then we'll then I'll throw it. So, um, because I'm starting a new program, great, thank you guys, Rockstar Golf Club. All right. Um, so in five years, I hope to be having a really successful, large, under, underrepresented population of students in the biological sciences at Iowa State. So that I'll be running a program that has a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, um, education and bring what we call the biology scholars program model from UC Berkeley to Iowa State. Um, and so. Um, I also continue in five years to be able to have contact with my students that are out here now as they're making their transitions uh, professionally and so that I can see their growth and when they're ready to harass me for letters or career advice, they can do that in five years. So, one quick look. Yeah. In the five years, uh, my son will be eight and my other son will be five 
and I would have uh, just been um, two years into a tenure track because I just submitted my mid-tenure track or my mid-tenure package. And so I see myself um, in a position where I successfully developed a strong research program that involves tribes in the areas of water resource challenges, environmental challenges, and really making an impact with tribal stakeholders, and even to um, North American indigenous people and South American indigenous people on how they can um, um, effectively integrate their traditional knowledge into the way science, uh, specifically environmental science, that is applied to their environmental challenges. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just say one thing, but I do want to get to the questions. To me, it's always important that we all have a five-year plan. If you'd like to hear mine, we can definitely talk, but I think it's important that we get some questions from the audience. But Thank always you. have that five-year plan. We'll start here, and then we'll go here. So, please. Yeah. Uh, at this point, we're still dramatically underrepresented in sciences generally, and I think this is true of all minorities, uh, including women. What are the barriers that are being encountered uh, considering that you know at, at this point in the general population the demographics are becoming much more not necessarily even but well distributed so where's the resistance coming from now I think it comes when people think that you're not good enough and they try to discourage you but you have to be determined and you have to have a goal to not let no one or anything stop you because as a scientist, oh yeah, I had a lot of obstacles that came my way, but you learn from those and you convert them into positive things. So I think that's something that helped me throughout graduate school because whatever happened negatively, I converted it positive, positively and I continued on. I grew up in you know, what they call the ghetto, but I'm very proud to, to be a Compton student because I was able to show that with perseverance and being determined, that I was able to overcome anything. So now you can take me anywhere and it's fine, but it's people that can try to discourage you, but you have to be strong. Oh, go ahead. Uh, my perspective comes from Native American perspective. We're the minority of minorities. Mm -hmm. And so for Native Americans, um, my, I myself have only been involved in SACNIS for seven years. So I think um, there needs to be more involvement of Native American students in SACNES because there's a lot of opportunity to learn about pursuing a PhD, going to academia. Um, I'm glad to see that the American Indian Science and Engineering Society recently uh, was awarded a grant where they can focus on um, Native American graduate students going into academia because right now there's only a handful of Native American faculty in the university and so I think if we can support the Native American community that way, there can be more representation. Um, the challenge facing Native students is um, cultural barriers in the sense that they're, we're very connected to our community. We're very, uh, we have obligations to our community through um, different cultural events and ceremonial events. And then just the adjustment, leaving the reservation and then coming to the city, a lot of students um, are not able to adjust and they go back to the reservation. So if we can a a address those ta challenges, I, I can see just a huge potential for Native American uh, representation in uh, academia and industry and so forth. I'll add one little quick thing, which is in some institutional barriers of how we select students. I mean, the SAT does not predict student mm -hmm. success. Uh, GPA, there's a story behind the SAT and GPA of every student, and we need to figure that, getting that story, I can help a student, we can all help students Thanks. when we know a little bit more about the background and the skills that they had to get to the University of California, Berkeley, or Santa Cruz, or wherever it is, you've, had, you've already come overcome a lot of those barriers to get to that level. Applying those barriers to the next scientific challenge or the next educational challenge is just had to redefine that a little bit. Um, the other la last thing is the GRE for graduate school admissions does not predict anything about student success in, in the sciences. So smart programs are getting beyond that, but that's still a barrier um, at this stage. May I ask a, an extension? Yeah, okay. quickly. So how then would you redesign 
what we're doing in admissions and in assessing student achievement? So there are programs out there and there's ongoing research experiments and, and programs out there that are quite successful at it. The Meyerhoff program is, is nationally known. The Biology Scholars program, I'll pat myself on the back. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's, but there's, there's other programs out there. It's not just those two, obviously. There's people out there that are doing great outreach and, and um, achieving great student success. We just need to teach the rest of our institutions, and they're sometimes resistant to changing how we teach intro biology and chemistry so that it's not you know, a nightmare weed out course. You know, if you don't have AP chemistry or AP biology, you, oftentimes your possibility of succeeding as an undergraduate are a lot lower. And our institutions have to be more flexible on how we deal with that. And, that, and, and give the students the awareness that it's not them that's necessarily the problem. They've got skills, they just need to, to learn and adapt them to a new situation. So, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ivory Polk, and I'm a McNair Scholar at the University of Central Florida. I am also a chapter member of SACNIS. I have a more discipline-specific question. So, Dr. Welch, you said that you work with animal models, um, and my question was, what are the biggest challenges you foresee for animal models um, in translational medicine, and what advice do you have for dealing with animal models, because I like animal models. Okay, so I, I got a quick answer, which is basically I didn't work with um, model organisms, I, I studied wild animals. Um, and so they were a whole different set of challenges versus working with lab rats or lab mice. Um, so, yeah, um, so some of the animals that we can learn from in nature that we aren't studying closely, like that grasshopper mouse that, I was, that, that carnivorous rodent that was tipping its head back, they eat scorpions. And one of the new research things is the neuroscientists figured out the scorpion sting actually numbs the animal. So it, continues to feel no pain, and how that is able to block this receptors on the cellular level is a whole other area of translational medicine might come out of that. So these kind of basic research questions can often lead to really cool translational um, situations. Um, but you know, you gotta kind of love weird natural animals <laughs> in nature. Um, if you really wanna push the uh, envelope, oftentimes you're gonna be working with model organisms, because they're they are, there's a value in having model species that we know a ton about with inbred lines and things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Crystal Thomas and I'm a sophomore from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so I just was wondering what you could do after you get your PhD, because because it seems to me like it's it's just been a track so far, right? You go to college, you go to grad school, get your PhD, postdoc, but and then it seems like either you become a professor or in, go to industry. What what can you really? What else could you do with your with a PhD? There's different things like science policy. You could be working in Congress. Um, you can be working at the NIH, creating programs, science programs like the program that I was part of as an undergrad. Um, the Minority um, Biomedical Research Support Program. I'm a product of the MBRS program, McNair, like programs like McNair. So you could do many things for your PhD, not only doing basic science research or working in the industry, but you can use it in a different way. And if you're interested in like writing journal, um, uh, articles for journals, that's another thing. So there's different options. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else wanna address that? I had that question when I was um, deciding what to do next after receiving my PhD. And with a PhD, you just have so many different opportunities. You can basically do anything that you want to. You can be your own boss. You can have your consultant firm. You can do research, be a research scientist. You can go to industry. You can work for a corporate uh, corporation. Um, you can also be um, working in the university in different positions, whether it's um, doing like application science or doing some um, uh, working on partnerships with different stakeholders or institutions. There are just so many different opportunities once you get your PhD and it just depends on what, what you want to pursue, but um, it just really opens up a lot of doors for you when you get your PhD. Can I just, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just going to add one thing is that as you think about where you want to uh, go to and do your PhD, think about what area you want to try and focus on perhaps because 
if you go and get your PhD in chemistry, uh, there may be limitations on how much you can expand, right? But if you really have that passion for chemistry, you can definitely expand beyond that, be in a chemical company and then grow within that company, for example, or be in a university and get involved with uh, recruiting uh, students or you know, programs like Sakhnas and so on. So think about it, research it a little bit before you fully commit and see what's out there. Talk to folks here with, that are doing perhaps what you're interested in as well. And realize you're not gonna know right now. You, you can project yeah. as much as you can, but ultimately you going through all that education and that getting those degrees means you're a creative problem solver and then you can apply yourself to new problems. Um, and so I, there's no way I could have predicted I was gonna be working, running this program or running the little bit of program that I do run and that I'm getting to this next job. That was not in my reality until, you know, in the last five years. And so, yeah. Hi, my, can you hear me? Yeah. No? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Miriam Oliveira. Um, I was actually a biology scholars, um, scholar, sorry, go Bears. Um, so my question to you is, how do you make uh, mentorship sustainable? Um, and what I mean by that is I actually went into a PhD program and I had a lot of challenges with my advisor. Um, and at Cal, I had really great mentorship, um, but the mentors were usually people who had gone through the challenges that I had faced. For example, um, Dr. Tyrone Hayes, um, but he is someone who's overloaded with students who are seeking mentorship and yet we see faculty members who could potentially rise to that challenge, but are probably not so. So how do you institutionalize something like making um, more effective tools for mentorship for people who haven't gone through those challenges? Yes. Well, for me, um, being a SACNAS member for 14 years, I've was able to uh, meet mentors and we have to be the, the ones to be proactive because a lot of them are very busy so whenever there was a problem it was not only just from your institution but people from different places where you could say let me pick up the phone and let me call this person because they could even give you their cell phone numbers where they could say hey call me anytime I might be busy but you, I, I will return your call we have to be more proactive because if you let the person do it all by him or herself it's not gonna happen because they're busy. So as a mentee, you have to be the one, um, I'm just sending you a quick email, giving you an update of what's going on, or I have a problem that came upon, I need your help. And that's how you create, but you have to be proactive about being the one. It's not that you're bothering them, no, not at all. Oh, so my question was more in regards to you and more along the lines of the position that you hold now and how that sort of helps you um, provide sort of a peer example so that you're not the only ones doing the mentoring. I see. So you, uh, I think at every institution and it's the networking and, and you finding um, like-minded people. You find who your allies are at the institution. Um, you're not gonna make institutional change by you yourself kicking down doors. I mean, to an extent, you're going to have to have um, faculty support, a dean support. There's different ways that you can tap into um, administrators, provosts, even higher level folks. Um, and sometimes you have to work around those very people as well. So sometimes the allies aren't going to be enough. There's going to be other barriers. And so um, how to institutionalize that transition is a tough question. Um, you know, you've mentioned your, your struggles a little bit with your PhD advisor. I mean, that's, that's common. I mean, the perfect PhD advisor might be a nightmare for you, you know, your, your colleague right next to you. And so that's always another one of those challenges of kind of how you identify mentors and what you can get from those mentors um, and how you collaborate with them. Um, you have to sometimes be creative to work around, you know, barriers and it can be the people who are supposed to be advocating for you um, on the first line. If I could just uh, add a little bit to that is, I'm not sure how you would in institutionalize it, but what I would recommend that I've done myself is 
you know, when I've gone to somebody and approached them for mentorship and me being a mentee, uh, if they see that there is somebody that's more suitable, they will direct me to them. And as individuals come to me and maybe they're looking for a mentor relationship, and I see somebody that may be more suitable for them, I would guide them in that direction and see how the connection works. I won't abandon them completely because at the same time, I want to be able to continue to, to make sure that they're comfortable in coming to me. But you know, I do that here. I've seen it done here with other folks as well. And I think that's a great way to go. And like uh, Dr. Ramirez was saying, um, you want to reach out so that you get started and then you can get redirected. But how to institutionalize that, uh, that might be difficult. It might be something that we start doing here and we continue to do. Oh. Hey, um, Start over again, please. My name is Logan Baldwin III. I'm a uh, senior at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I'm also a part of the RISE program and have that wonderful gift in uh, Dr. Uh, Robles. And I want to thank you all for being there and getting to the door and opening it up for the rest of us to get through. But my question to you would be, what is the biggest protective factor you have within yourself and how does that help you to overcome the biggest threat? to whatever you had to get to? Well, I grew up in a very humble family. And one thing that my parents taught me was to always be respectful. So if there was something negative from somebody who tried to discourage me, I would always smile and say, you know, we all have the right to have an opinion, but this is what I want to do. So in a way, I became very protective because um, I knew what my goal was. At the time, I thought I was going to become a pediatrician, which was something that I thought, oh, I'm going to be a medical doctor, but never knew that I was going to become a scientist. But some, an incident happened in junior high school that opened my, up, opened up my, my, uh, my eyes. And after that, I said, everything that happens, I'm going to be optimistic, and I'm going to live life to the fullest, and I'm not going to let anything stop me. So I think that's what helped me throughout these years, just being optimistic and converting whatever negative you think it is, converting it, converting it to positive, and just with a smile, continuing on. I mean, it's hard because we're humans, and I'm not gonna deny that, yeah, there's times where you're like, oh, can I really do this? But then there's a deep voice in there that says, yes, you can. Just get up and continue on. So you just have to learn to be positive. Sometimes it might be hard, but it, it's doable. For me, um, it is uh, the strength of my people and um, my creator and also uh, carrying my identity, which is my parents and my grandparents. And one thing I think back to always is that my people have been oppressed from the day that uh, Europeans set foot on this continent. And uh, particularly, my people have been um, set on the long walk back in the 1800s, and um, my people were uh, predicted to not survive that time, but yet they came through. So I know that strength of my people is within me, and the challenges that I face are um, not nearly the, the, the same challenges that they faced back <clears throat> then. So I know that you know through that strength, I can, I can make it through these challenges. And one, one saying that uh, my, my people have is which means it's, it's in you, it's individual responsibility, and that um, allows me to go forward and know that I have the strength from my ancestry to um, carry forward in reaching my dreams. Uh, I'll just add uh, a little bit to that and give you a little bit of my personal. When I think about protectiveness that you mentioned. Um, I was reaching far back to when I was at, uh, in high school and went on to Wisconsin. And you know, we've all gone through a lot of challenges and we all have to be uh, strong and we're really breaking barriers and we're moving ahead. And I feel like what happens as you continue to grow, you're gonna be questioned a lot. Mm -hmm. For me, the way that I see that is I try to protect myself in that I know that everyone out there is gonna be questioning what I say and how I say it. So I tried to put a lot of thought into my work, this is as a toxicologist, and um, you know, really put the best foot out there so that when they see what I do, um, they see that it was good, solid work. Right? 
and they have very minimal opportunity to attack or to uh, hold it against me in a way, right? I feel like the moment that that would happen and I let that guard down, perhaps, and it's not like I'm always on guard because I always try to enjoy the environment and I like working with the folks that I do, but I do put thought into the work that I deliver. So the example I was gonna use is when I was in Wisconsin, a lot of the, the when I was doing my PhD, I got to know a lot of folks out there, right? And I met some farmers, and sure enough, I'd go to these little villages, uh, villages, little towns, right? Thousand people, they had a little gathering, some corn fest and something like that. And one of my friends would always introduce me as, hey, this is my friend, Noe, he's Mexican, you know? I was like, you know, Mexicans can do PhD, under, <laughs> under you know, represented minorities can do PhDs. So it was very interesting, but I think that kind of opened uh, my eyes to how people perceive you. And to me, I think about being, you know, always keeping that guard and making sure that I'm doing the best I can so that as they see what I do, the, the background I come with, that's carried within their vision of what they see. And they see students that are starting to uh, go to graduate school or undergraduate school. They see them and they say, oh, that kid reminds me of Noe. I know he's gonna be successful or he's gonna be able to move ahead and not Oh, that, you know, look what happened to Noah. He just blows it all the time, put his foot in the mouth, and, you know, we don't want someone like that, so let's not give those opportunities. So it's always about being uh, able to put your best foot forward. Hold on one second. I, um, Dr. Ramirez, I coached at Compton High School, or coached oh. wrestling at Compton High School. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> don't mess with that guy. He's going to put you in a press. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. Go ahead. Is my mic on? Yeah. Okay. All right, my name is Lauren Thurlow. I'm an undergraduate biochemist at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also in the McNair Scholars Program, so that's why I'm here today. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, any struggles that you have with your family. You mentioned that your family was a big part of your support network, and um, I just wanted to know if they ever like doubted you or if they were always there like guiding you, and um, if you have any suggestions for convincing them that yes, si se puede. <laughs> oh. I'll go, I'll go first. Oh, okay. sorry. No, no, I don't know if she was asking. Oh yeah, all go, of ahead, us go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. But for me particularly, uh, my parents have always been very supportive and it's very rare in a Mexican family, but I'm an only child. So whenever I would say, um, I'm going to this internship in England, through the MERT program, they're like, where? England. Um, okay, is that gonna help you? Yes, okay, go on. So I went to England, and after that experience, um, they were like, you can go anywhere. So I did the Leadership Alliance program where I went to Brown University, and that's how I became fam um, familiarized with Brown, but they never told me no, because my parents didn't have the education, but they wanted the best for me. Um, and for me, those are the most important people in my life, my parents. If other family members doubt it, I don't really care, <laughs> to be honest. But to have that support from my parents was more than enough. And they never said, no, I don't think you could do this, or uh, I don't know, uh, maybe rethink about it. No, they always said, whatever you think it's going to help you pursue your dream, go for it. And I left California, never thinking that I was going to do that going from California to Frederick, Maryland, then coming back to California, then applying to grad school, going to Providence, Rhode Island, and then Maryland, and then after that, I hope to come back. But um, nope, they've always been very supportive. One of, one of the big challenges for me was just letting, getting uh, better at communicating to my family about why this was important to me. Like, when they kept questioning, when are you gonna come back to Montana and get a real job? You know, that kind of thing, so, and, and they're still saying it, no. I mean, my family teases me about that, but they're completely supportive of it. Um, I've gotten better at communicating why this is really cool work to me when I was studying weird pocket gophers. It's so much easier to sell to your family and your community, I'm studying cancer genetics, than I'm studying conservation biology of a western pocket gopher. But I could explain that to them eventually, and, and again, that ability to communicate science is going to be, as you move through, you're going to be put in these opportunities to lead and to be able to talk to your community and talk to your family. And so the first people you need to convince is around the Thanksgiving table um, is, you know, grandma and mom and dad and cousins and such. So, yeah. For me, my biggest challenge with my family was just understanding because my parents, they don't use uh, the English language 
uh, they they speak Navajo. They never left the reservation. They don't know what college is about. You know the challenges that I face. So um, that was the challenge for me, just that understanding and that you know I, I needed to to take a class and stay up all night and um, and I was tired from that and being in a place where I was the only Native American and 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 the feeling that I had to go through in terms of being constantly being mistaken for being Asian and you know all those things and so um, so I just had to you know communicate that with my parents I brought my parents to Stanford when I was a junior and they got to go to class with me and I try to bring my parents to where I am so that they could see what I do and so that they can understand the challenges that I, that I face and be even a bigger supporter for me. Oh, go ahead. Can I just add something real quick? Uh, for me, uh, one of the biggest challenges was the last time I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was uh, starting high school. And I came without my parents and it was just with my brother. It was very difficult because they were very supportive as I was doing that because they knew that I would have more opportunities here in the U.S. Uh, but I was able to live with my relatives here uh, and they were very supportive and very encouraging, very motivational. Um, somebody that was very uh, impactful to me wanting to be successful was my cousin. He's actually here in the audience today. Um, we were in high school together and then we ended up in Santa Cruz together as well. But one thing that was very interesting, my parents were very supportive and I remember when I graduated from high school, one of the things that my dad first told me, he's like, mijo, so you're going back to Mexico, right? I said, dad, you know, I can go and do a bachelor's, you know, and it's, it's free. I was like, oh, really? Okay, go for it. So he was supported. By, by that, and I, you know, I really enjoyed it. Um, so when I graduated from Santa Cruz, I got my bachelor's, and my dad comes up to me and says, Mijo, you're going back to Mexico, right? It's like, Dad, this is a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's free. So I said, all right, great, go for it. Uh, when I finished my PhD, um, my dad said, it's like, will you come visit us? <laughs> <laughs> so, but they were supportive, and they were really there, even though they had their own wishes, but they understood by communicating, like they've mentioned as well. Very important as well. So. Thank you, your parents always want you to stay close, yeah. They do. Now they come visit me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Sarah Castaneda, a senior biomedical science major at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And my question for you all is, what advice do you have for students who will be graduating with a bachelor's relatively soon, hopefully, um, but facing a gap year in between this step and the next, whether professional school or graduates, graduate school? It, take the year. You know, <laughs> don't, don't beat yourself up about it. Um, a lot of PhD programs actually prefer that you do take a year off um, so you really know this is exactly what you want to do. No one's asked that I worked for Mayflower Trucking for six months and worked on a bad TV movie for uh, a month. No one cares. It was, when you, are you ready for graduate school? You're ready for that next step? Then you're ready. So you apply when you're ready. I, t I took one year off and mm -hmm. I worked in a lab, um, but I knew I was gonna go on to graduate school. But whatever you're comfortable with, you wanna make sure that that's what you want and you're not being pressured to do what you're not wanting to do. I actually took four years off but I knew that I was going to continue on, so I did that post back program, and then after that, I worked for a little bit as a research tech, and then I continue on to grad school. Check, check out the NIH post back prep programs. Those are awesome mm. as well. Absolutely. I did the Introduction to Cancer Research Careers program, which they bring students into the NIH before anybody else, and you get to interview with them, and that's how I did my post back. And again, that information was obtained from a SACMIS yeah. conference. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yep. Hello, my name is uh, Victor Villarreal, and I'm also a McNair Scholar from uh, Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Uh, my question is, uh, I know that you guys are really successful now, but was there ever a point when you were a student where you had a particular failure or something happened? <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> yes. and uh, how, did, how did you guys turn that into a uh, key to success? I'll tell, I, I got a 1.8 one quarter. Um, yeah, and a lot. Um, I overloaded on classes and got sick and grandfather passed and, and uh, you don't take OCAM calculus, genetics, and TAM uh, intro biology class at the same time. 
I said, stupid. I was naivete, <laughs> and I was cocky, and I thought I could handle it. And, and so, you know, and, and I ran into some, uh, a faculty member who was really difficult with me about um, coming back and taking midterms, you know, the day after um, the funeral, and I thought that was kind of pretty harsh, and so I just dropped my chemistry minor and never took a class from that guy again. Cause, and now, did I hurt myself? No, I didn't, I, but I used a little bit of that kind of what I would consider righteous anger towards, oops, sorry, uh, to reinvest in kind of my own success, and so I didn't, you know, that, that was an opportunity that I could have really tripped up. Um, you know, the bigger opportunities that I overcame were in junior high and high school, really. I mean, you know, the neighborhood and being low income, first gen, and you didn't quite know. Most of my friends didn't finish high school that I hung out with in junior high. They didn't finish on the right time um, or at all. So that to me was probably the bigger survival, and I don't even know exactly how I did that outside of family and being somewhat good in school at that level. Yeah. I think for me it was um, two times when I was uh, a freshman at Stanford. I failed my calculus uh, course and um, did, was doing, not doing well in my courses. And so um, it was just a moment of reflection, like what can I do to continue on and seeking out those programs um, within the universities, like tutoring through the math department and even um, getting some tutoring for writing because I had always been a straight A student, but um, I, there was an academic adjustment that I needed to go through. So sticking out those opportunities that can help me um, refine my academic skills really was helpful. And then when I was a PhD student, um, my research data didn't look like we had expected. And so there was a question of whether I could continue on and um, it was advised to me to maybe you should just get a master's degree, a second one. And so that really m angered me because I expected, um, you know, the person to say, no, you know, try this other way, you know, try a different method. And so I turned that around and, and I just went back to the drawing board and um, tried to, to, to continue on and, and it was really, um, a critical time for me and I'm glad I, I chose to just continue on and you know we all go through challenges like everybody said here it's just a matter of finding that internal drive and, and being confident in yourself that you know um, if we could do it you could do it as well so it, it's been done and um, it can be done again uh, my name is Samir Taj I'm from Cal State Monterey Bay I'm undergraduate and I'll be graduating soon so I, I was just wondering um, how you guys understood your limitations. So knowing how much knowledge you have and I guess uh, the influence of like yourself and possibly others like parents uh, telling you, or not telling you, but using that, that, the use of that knowledge towards your PhD degree. Um, how, how did you understand that? Like I, I know that sometimes people just uh, they take the easy route or they take the hard one. Sometimes people do it for different reasons, for like having a, just want to have a, enough money to have like a, a family and support yourself. But I was just wondering how you guys, what were you guys' uh, thoughts about that when you guys pursued PhDs? Well, I like the challenge and whenever they say no, then to me that's like, oh no, okay, let me go this way, this is what I want. Because um, I faced, uh, um, a situation in graduate school where I actually was told that I didn't have what it took to be a PhD student and that I could just be done with a master's and make such a great difference in my Latino community. That was very shocking, but at the same time, it gave me that strength to continue on and make a difference not only in my Latino community, in any community from West Coast to East Coast, and that's what I do wherever I go. Um, but that's basically, basically it. Go ahead. Uh, I'll say, I, I didn't really think about it in terms of what were my limitations. I thought about what were my interests in the passion that I had towards what I wanted to do. And for me, that was 
recognizing that toxicology was really going to provide me with a lot of the answers and you know address the questions that I was looking for, the tools that I needed. Um, and by pursuing that and really moving forward and saying, I want to be a toxicologist, it just turned out that getting a PhD was the highest you can do at that time to be able to be considered a toxicologist. Good answer. Hi, I'm Eduardo Munoz, and I'm a senior at Allegheny College. And well, so, um, we already know there's a very low representation of Hispanics and Native Americans in higher institutions of higher learning. And uh, as I've gone over throughout my entire college career, I've noticed that the numbers dwindle down even further. For example, my institution, I can literally count the amount of Hispanic students in a science major with just my hands. And so I'm just wondering, do you guys have any recommendations to convince these people to stay within the STEM field? Because I know a lot of them lose motivation. They go through the weeder courses. They, it's really tough for them to pick themselves back up after they've been pushed down so hard. And so I'm just wondering, have you, I'm sure you made it seem as you've all gone through these situations. What can we do to reinstill motivation and inspiration to these students? So I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly, but you know, use your peers. The peer-to-peer the -peer pressure to kind of like, hey, we miss you at study group. You know, you know, why aren't you coming to class? Come sit with me. Those kinds of little bit of outreach like that can help save a student who might be dealing with more stuff at home or working too many hours outside of class. So there's a lot of different things that can trip a student up. Um, when we create a good support network, amongst our peers, either that are, have shared a common bond. They don't have to necessarily be all Latino and, and, um, and it can be across cultures and across uh, class. But if the common theme is community and support for each other, there's nice data showing students succeed as, as well as any other student in STEM. Next question. Hi, uh, my name's Francie Latour. Um, I coordinate a summer research program at a biomedical institute in Boston focusing in genomics. Um, I want to thank you all for sharing your stories. Um, they're really, really helpful and instructive and inspiring. Um, so one question that I have has to do with um, something that's been talked about a little bit, but just asking for help. Um, one of the things that I think um, we encounter with our students is that there is a very strong um, self-reliance um, and part of what it means to be strong is not showing weakness and part of what it means to be weak is to ask for help and so students can get locked in a cycle of wanting to prove themselves which can actually interfere with advancing and I wonder if you all could speak to that. I, d I deal with that regularly with students that have struggled, maybe had a bad rough semester, and the next semester, like, well, I got to double down and retake that calculus <laughs> and take 18, 20 units. And it's like, no, please don't do that. Um, so oftentimes it just means the student needs um, a safe space where they can actually vent their frustrations, and that can be through a program, it can be through peers can be through counselors or, or you know wherever you can find your mentors and knowing that you have that kind of support is going to be really valuable when things happen there's gonna I mean I every one of us I know has struggled we've talked about different examples of almost quitting our PhDs or being kind of told at various levels you know you're not making it right now and sometimes we know that better than they do but and we've internalized a little bit of that that failure a little bit, or we don't want to be um, vulnerable because you know there's a lot of bluffing that um, dominant culture scientists do, and you get trained actually to do that as a PhD. I think um, you guys may disagree or agree, but I can talk confidently about stuff I don't know anything about sometimes, and I think that's partly because of the PhD training. Um, and this answer might be an example of that. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> <laughs> but. I think that the creating a safe space is particular is, is my take home on that. So that students have a place where they can actually be vulnerable and exposed without it being punished by the institution or the, the culture of the, 
of the class or the, um, the research community? I think you have to create that support group and also have people that you can trust because we all go through moments where it's okay to cry and just let it go. Because sometimes, like you mentioned, there's people who don't like to show the actual situation. And like Corey was saying, it's also very important to have that um, support group and just let it out and then it's, it's gonna be okay. Hi again, I'm Crystal. Um, something I've been wondering about is that I have some friends who are Mexican or um, Latino and they don't quote, quote, look what you would think of a Mexican or a Latino, right? And they are hesitant or try to keep people from knowing their background or, or their ethnicity. Um, because they feel that people will perceive them a certain way. And I feel like I can't give, I personally can't give them advice because people see me and they're like, oh, this, we, we, we quote, quote, know what you are, right? Um, I just wanted to know for people like that who want to go in the sciences and then are afraid, are afraid of people finding out um, their race, what, what should they do? What, like, like, do, do they just keep hiding it? Do they just wait, only let people they really trust know? Because I, 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 I don't really know what to give advice to my friends in that kind of situation. I'll give you a, an example that I have. Um, and this is kind of how I decided to act towards this. When I first went to Wisconsin, um, after my first year of hardly getting any sun, because I was in the lab, I was not 10, I lost it, right? So a lot of people did not know really what I was. And I didn't help myself because I would just tell people, oh, I'm from California, I'm from Southern California. Oh, the California guy, right? Um, but then uh, I think it just dawned on me. I said, well, why am I not sharing this? It's a great experience. I want folks, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, I want folks to understand that within the Latino community, with the underrepresented communities, we have this talent to be able to pursue a higher degree. So I eventually started telling people that I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. Then I got the, but you don't look Mexican. I said, no, no, I am. Trust me, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, they, then they would hear me speak Spanish, right? And at that point, the population of Spanish speakers in Wisconsin was very low. But what ended up happening for me was I ended up engaging a lot of them. And they worked in restaurants and so on. So then these folks would tell me, but, but you're not in a restaurant. I was like, well, you know, I go to school. I'm doing my PhD here. So I had to recognize that it was really uh, about being proud of where you come from. And it took me a little bit to get there. So I would encourage that you tell them to be proud of where they're at. But at the same time, put that right foot forward, right? So I was not out there um, with bad behaviors, if you will. Uh, definitely having fun. That was always a good you know, plus for me. So they knew me for that. But you know, well, the biggest thing was, like my friend would introduce me, oh, this is my friend Noe. He's Mexican. And he's doing a PhD. And I think that was one of the most important things, that we want to be able to present ourselves in that way. And then you carry the pride of where you come from, whatever uh, population you come from. There's beauty in all the cultures that come from our under-representation. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Mary Carmen from Mount St. Mary's. I'll be graduating in May with a bachelor's in mathematics and a minor in biology. And my question is, how did you, it's personal, it's how did you support yourself through uh, your careers, both undergrad, postdoctorate, graduate, because I know for myself, I worked two part-time jobs at one point. Right now, I'm currently working one part-time job. But how did you guys put yourself through school? Stu student loans, financial aid was, <laughs> and then I was so excited when I found out that you about what grad school that you got paid, like twenty thousand, or well, I guess when I first started, it was twelve thousand dollars a year. Sounded like insane money to go chase rodents, and so. Um, <laughs> So you could call that low expectations, um, <laughs> but, but um, 
it, you know, I, it bums me out when I hear students working out, having to work that much, because it means you don't have time for clinical volunteering, you're for pre-med, you don't have time for a research lab often. Um, and so if you can balance, if you can, a small number of small loans, not like, you know, a couple thousand a year, if that's enough to free you up to do these other things in your profession, then please try to do that. And I know that's not always an option for students, but. Well, yeah. that's actually why I quit one of the part-time jobs. I picked up research and um, I'll actually be one of the presenters, so. Thanks. <laughs> Um, my parents um, earned at that time back in the 90s $700 a month mm -hmm. and I was going to go to Stanford where the current tuition was $28,000 a year and so I was very proactive in applying for every scholarship that I was eligible for just getting, um, going to the library at the time we didn't have internet so going to the library, flipping through, finding those opportunities just applying for it, and, and many of them I think, you know, I wasn't awarded, but the ones that I did get awarded really helped uh, tremendously in, in the pa financial aid package that I received. And then when I, once I got to campus, um, talking to professors and finding um, different ways to, to work, like I worked at American Indian Program, and um, so just being proactive, and then just constantly I was always trying to find scholarships and grants to, to fund myself. So, so I would encourage to you to do that because, um, you know, uh, having that flexibility does, is beneficial because you're focusing on your academics and you're getting good grades. And then getting good grades will help you be more competitive for other scholarships. So then you have the internet, you know, just going out there and, and doing searches and trying to find um, those opportunities. Uh, let's do one quick thing, then you answer. Um, we've got five minutes left, and so the last questions, I want you guys to do lightning round, and we'll do lightning round answers. So finish your answer. So I got a full ride scholarship, the presidential scholarship at Cal State Dominguez Sills, and also the John Gogan Family Foundation gave me the scholarship. So I had a full ride, no debt, and I went to grad school, everything paid. So if you go in the sciences, everything's paid for. And they give you a stipend. So that stipend is for your rent and your food. So pursue a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question. Uh, as part of being a culture of diversity, how would you cope when you come into a work environment, specifically in the STEM fields, and you're, let's say, you're one of the few Hispanics, or whatever the case may be, how would you cope with that? You have to speak on behalf of all Hispanics everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure, right? I mean, well, you feel that sometimes in the room, but yeah, that's, I mean, sometimes you have to educate people and, and, and there's not a nice clean, clean, clean answer on that. Help more people behind, that are following behind you or support your peers that are around you and you two will walk into the room together. Else want to I, I think it's a challenge for me because um, in, in our culture, you know, the young people are, are not expected to talk. So even when I went to college, I had to learn how to communicate. And then now as a professor, it, it is, um, gets tiring because you're seen as, you know, the representation for all Native Americans. And so I have to go into faculty meetings and be prepared and just uh, be prepared to, to speak up and to participate and, and, and just, just to uh, um, do the best that I can and, and, and see myself in, in, in that work environment and to, to, to be on my game. Hey, I'm uh, Pablo Jimenez Corredor. I'm a mechanical engineer at Purdue University. And my question is, uh, what opportunities are available to begin applying research beyond academia, such as industry and public policy. You want to take that one? Sure, I'll take it real quick. Uh, so within industry, a lot of organizations will invest money towards research. Now, a little bit different than academia because you write your grant and there's uh, hopefully the hopes of doing translational, right? In industry, it's driven by what are the product lines that are going to be part of the portfolio for that company. Right? And what's going to make sure that you have the best product out there? In my case, I look for the sound science supporting the safety of the products. 
so I can collaborate with uh, institutions as well, so I don't necessarily have to do all the research in-house. So there's ways to work through that in industry. Hi, my name is Salik Hatcher, and I'm with the MBRS RISE program at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And my question for you is, um, I'm a sociology major, and I have so many ideas that I want to research. Um, how are you able to narrow down what you wanted to research? Anybody want to take that one? I, I can go. Go for it. Okay. Um, write down kind of, so one of the things in sociology or if you're in biology, I make my students the broad interest. Um, what are the faculty's research pages that you like at this institution mm -hmm. or out there? What, I talk to the student about what are you passionate about? Is it, and then oftentimes the student doesn't necessarily fully know, oh, what you're talking about is ecology. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, your common theme in all of your preferences are birds in some version of birds. So you kind of have to tease that apart a little bit with a student. Um, there's not a set one way to go down this. Navigate, meander a little bit. Go do a summer of research in sociology or public health and see if you like it. You may find it that you hate it, great. You figured out public health is off the table. So finding out what you hate is also a good part of this process and just keep exploring a little bit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Safia Tahimba. I'm a biology student at Consumers River College. I wanted to know what would your advice be for either dealing with or avoiding the feeling of burnout and that feeling prohibiting you from performing your best in school? Well, you have to be active in things that you like. I like photography, so I do a lot of photography. Um, as a grad student, I was part of the mariachi where I used to sing. Um, that was fun to me. And then I also um, became part of a tango group where I learned how to dance tango. So that was like my release of stress. So you have to do fun stuff too. You have to keep a balance, because if not, you're gonna get burned out. And acknowledge when you are feeling burnt out. Mm -hmm. you know, it means you take a night off. Or and you take sleep. A, and sleep, <laughs> and exercise, Eat watch a movie. And sleep. <laughs> yeah. And own it and don't, don't worry about it. Two, two, three hours is not gonna break you. I think we're out of time. Yes. We are, but I think we can go longer if we just want to keep answering questions. Okay. Questions. Or are we, are we done, done? We got a couple more minutes. Okay, so we'll do one more question. Sorry, in regards guys. to. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in regards to taking years off of school, what are the steps to go back to school? Um, it was a little bit tough for me because I had oh you have to get information in the internet like okay what are the requirements to become a student and whatever you want to study but it was a little bit t difficult for me to become a student again and learning how to study and focusing so you have to learn relearn how to focus and study and I would go to the library and finding a place where I was able to get stuff done but it was a little tough for me after being away from school for a while. But um, just finding also like mentors or people that can help you and also taking um, advantage of the resources that are available at the universities. So I'd like to thank you guys all for coming. Um, feel free to acknowledge Carletta Chief. And Dr. Teresa Ramirez. And me. Right. Thank you. Um, the couple of students that didn't get a chance to ask questions, you can come up and still talk to us. And if you guys see us throughout the conference, make sure to stop us and ask us questions. We're here to mentor you guys because, like me, I was in one of those seats. So please come. Thanks.